Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Dr. Amanda Weiss, and I'm a licensed psychologist in practice for about 14 years. Uh, I've been with NAMVI's Veterinary Mental Health Support for the past few years, facilitating free support groups and individual sessions for vet med professionals, as well as providing psychoeducational webinars, uh, uh, webinars uh, and mindfulness-based groups. Uh, this is number three in our Mindfulness-Based Skills webinar series. Today's topic is holding yourself kindly, also known as self-compassion. So over the next 30-ish minutes, uh, I will define self-compassion, explore common barriers, share some of the benefits, and outline six common elements of developing self-compassion. By the end, my hope is that you will have several tangible options to begin showing up for yourself in a kind, caring, supportive way, especially during difficult moments. So for all humans, sour dishes are inevitably served onto the table of our lives. We all repeatedly experience failure, disappointment, rejection, self-doubt, grief and loss, fear, sadness, anxiety, anger, conflict, loneliness, health, relationship and work issues of all shapes and sizes, and the list goes on. And unfortunately, we often don't treat ourselves very well when all of those things are on our plate. So by de definition, you know, self-compassion is compassion turned inward, and it boils down to six simple words. Acknowledge your pain, respond with kindness. It means treating yourself with the same warmth, caring, gentleness, support, and kindness that you'd extend to someone you care about uh, if they were in similar pain. It can be applied to any challenging situation and moment of pain, moment of struggle, or moment of suffering, whether it be large or small. The yin of self-compassion involves being with ourselves in, a, in an accepting way, a comforting, soothing, and validating our own pain. The yang involves action to alleviate our suffering, right? protecting, providing, and motivating ourselves when needed. Self-compassion has three main components. The first is self-kindness versus self-judgment. Next is common humanity versus isolation. So as humans, we're programmed to be happy. One second, we had somebody else join. Okay. Um, so as humans, we're programmed to be happy and only showcase the good stuff, right? Which leads to masking and feeling more alone. While the truth is, you, me, and everyone else on this planet, we've got so much in common in terms, of, in terms of our suffering and our human experience. We all struggle. It's actually what connects us. Uh, and the third component to self-compassion is mindfulness over self-identification. And so mindfulness involves three core aspects, attention, intention, and attitude. Right? So paying attention on purpose, being grounded with what's happening in the present moment, approaching situations and inner experiences with curiosity and openness, and being non-judgmental, non so not labeling, judging, or criticizing. So this involves natural awareness versus self-identification, which involves internalizing a thought, feeling, or experience. So with mindfulness, we're looking at it versus looking through it. And so mindfulness is typically associated with loving awareness of experience, while self-compassion is loving awareness of the experiencer. Okay? And so mindfulness and self-compassion are actually the two wings of a bird. And as you all know, Birds can't fly with only one wing. And so we need both mindfulness and self-compassion in order to really take flight. 
One thing I do want to mention is that self-compassion is not a positive thinking strategy. It is a way to provide yourself with validation, understanding, and comfort during difficult moments. And while it is free of harshness, belittling, and self-judgment, it can involve constructive criticism and discernment, just in a matter more similar to the way you'd want your pizza to be delivered, quick, warm, and handled with care. Um, and so to really illuminate you know, uh, the idea of self-compassion, I'm gonna start with a little exercise, okay? So I want you to imagine that you are about to learn a new complicated and demanding skill. So you decide to enlist the assistance of a coach. In a moment, I will describe two coaches with different approaches who are available to help. It is important to know that, uh, they, are, that they both come highly recommended and you will get the same results with whomever you choose. So coach A is tough and harsh. She will drive you hard and never let you rest. She will focus on everything you do wrong constantly picking up on and pointing out any mistake you make, whether it be the tiniest or the biggest. She will e get easily irritated and try to make you feel bad about what you're doing, using a cold and harsh tone of voice. And even though this coach, you know, does keep you moving, it does feel like sometimes she's being cruel. Now, the other coach, Coach B, is encouraging, kind, warm, gentle, and understanding. She will help you set goals and will push you toward them, but she is supportive and motivating. This coach will look for your strengths, celebrate your successes, and urge you to take pride in your accomplishments. When times get tough, she will listen to you, and she will also remind you of your skills and your strengths in order to keep you motivated. So, Remembering that they both get you the same results, take a moment and think to yourself, which coach do you choose? So I use this uh, exercise with many, many people and most have chosen coach B. Come on, why wouldn't they? I mean, the idea of a coach who is kind, caring and supportive certainly sounds much more appealing than someone who is mean, harsh, and critical, especially if they get you the same results. Yet, when I then follow up with, which coach do you show up as for yourself? Most do respond with coach A. And that may be you know, familiar to you know, uh, what came up for you. And so unfortunately, outside the bounds of this hypothetical scenario, Choosing Coach B just isn't so straightforward. Right? This is due in part to society's old programming, common objections, worries, and a host of other factors that tend to surface and ultimately get in the way. Right? And so there are certainly many barriers when it comes to cultivating self-compassion. The most common barrier to holding yourself kindly or to self-compassion is the word itself. Right? Some people love the word self-compassion, but many people have a negative reaction to it for a plethora of reasons. So pro tip, if this does apply to you, a, a more user-friendly term than self-compassion is holding yourself kindly. People also often object to self-compassion on the grounds that is soft, weak, too touchy, feely, or flowery, you know, kind of the hippy-dippy stuff. Um, and that it doesn't fit in with their idea about how they should behave. Okay? We've grown up in these cultures where we're supposed to be tough and hard. And this seems to be the very opposite of that, right? Holding yourself kindly. There's a double standard here, though. If your colleague or friend was going through something similar and you responded to them by acknowledging how painful it was, you know, and with a real kindness, my guess is that you wouldn't think that that was weak or soft. Okay? If it's okay for you to do this for someone else, isn't it okay for you to do this for yourself? Okay. It is completely natural for your mind to judge this stuff as weak and soft 
because we've had a lifetime of being conditioned that way. Right? So of course, this is what our minds may say, but you don't have to go along with that old programming. Just because the terms kindness and compassion may come across to some as weak or not tough, please do remember that it requires a it requires deep reservoirs of strength to hold ourselves kindly. Self-compassion can also be fiercely self-protective and self-supportive. It is a source of strength and resilience in challenging situations. And ultimately, the truth is, we only add to the pain and the difficulty we're experiencing by refusing to respond to ourselves in a kind, caring, and supportive way. So instead, the invitation is to think about what kind of friend or coach you'd want by your side as you go through whatever it is you're going through, and then try being that coach or friend to yourself. Um, another barrier to self-compassion is getting fused or hooked or kind of uh, entangled with self-narratives about being unworthy or not deserving of kindness. Also fusion with rigid rules and reasons like, you know, uh, self-compassion is selfish or, you know, if I'm kind to myself, then I won't drive myself or I won't achieve anything. Right? These are very, very common objections that our mind makes. And so starting with the latter, research has consistently shown the opposite to be true. Right? Self-compassion actually enhances rather than undermines motivation and it improves performance and self-esteem. Unlike critical self-talk, self-compassion motivates with care, support, and encouragement rather than fear and shame. Kind self-talk is energizing and motivating, while harsh and critical self-talk is more demoralizing and overwhelming. Right? After you've kind of just, you know, really gone into yourself and, and was so harsh and critical with yourself, Typically, we don't feel so motivated, uh, you know, to go back and do whatever it was we were trying to do at that moment, right? So it really is not as effective as, you know, we've kind of been programmed to believe. With regard to being selfish, if you've ever traveled on an airplane, you've heard those announcements that if an oxygen mask dra uh, drops uh, down to make sure that you put your own mask on first, before you offer, offer assistance to the person next to you. The idea with self-compassion is exactly the same. You support, care, and look after yourself so that you can give to others, right? If you don't get the oxygen mask on your face within about 30 seconds, you're probably gonna lose consciousness and then you won't be able to help anyone else. And if you don't practice self-compassion, your energy levels are going to be severely depleted. You're going to be much less functional and much less of a benefit uh, and assistance to the animals and the other people that need you. So doing this is something that actually helps you so that you can help others. So by, you know, giving that air to ourselves, we can then breathe this air into others. Um, so our flaws, right, the parts of ourselves we're insecure about or dislike, they also keep us from being able to view ourselves compassionately. Um, also, believing that if you're not critical of yourself, you'll be letting yourself off the hook, right? That's another barrier. And so self-compassion does, does not mean letting yourself off the hook or that you don't care about others. Being self-compassionate means becoming aware of our struggles, our pain and our flaws, acknowledging them, and then recognizing that having flaws, making mistakes, and being in pain is actually part of the human experience. Right? It's the one thing that all humans have in common. So instead of listening to the destructive inner critic, you get to choose how you feel about yourself and to see the value in your imperfections because we all have them, right? It's what makes us human. Um, Self-compassion oftentimes is confused with self-pity and that becomes a barrier as well. 
So self-pity is a form of wallowing in our pain and suffering. And it pulls us into the sense that I am the only person who ever feels this way, that I'm alone in this. And it creates disconnection and more barriers that make it even harder to do the things we need to do. And it does not really help us deal with life's difficult moments. Whereas self-compassion is a faster and much more practical way uh, to go about this, right? You're not spending all day ruminating and wallowing. Instead, you're quickly acknowledging your struggle, your pain, your difficult thought or feeling, and then you're getting practical. What are the practical ways I can be kind, caring, and supportive to myself in this moment as I go through this? And then, you know, committing to that action, taking the steps that are needed to be able to show up for yourself in a kind, caring, supportive way. The reality is that stoicism, self-criticism, self-pity, self-blame, avoidance, nor rumination help us deal effectively with painful thoughts, feelings, and emotions in a way that is workable, in a way that helps us move toward a rich and meaningful life, and in a way that enables us to have a sense of vitality in the midst of difficult circumstances. While most of us find it far easier to be kind and understanding toward other people than ourselves, right? Or find it relatively easier uh, to be that way towards themselves when things are uh, go, you know, more smooth sailing, right? The, the ocean isn't so, doesn't have as many choppy waves going on, right? The real trick is being able to practice acceptance and hold yourself kindly when things are not going so well. Okay. And so while there are barriers, there are certainly ways to navigate those barriers. And that way you can experience the abundance of benefits that do come with self-compassion. And so a moment of self-compassion can change your entire day. A string of such moments can change the course of your life. During difficult moments, self-compassion allows us to accept things as they are, not as they should be, right? Which then ultimately fosters peace in the long term rather than suffering by, you know, rejecting the reality and thinking that it could or should be different and then being disappointed over and over again, okay? Showing up for ourselves as Coach B also improves performance, right? And it improves overall well being. It increases motivation and resilience. It enhances adaptive coping and emotional intelligence. It strengthens relationships and connections with ourselves and others. And it boosts confidence and self esteem. Right? And so I do want to just clarify that self esteem is an evaluation of self worth that is conditional and based on you know, our success. Whereas self-compassion involves unconditional self-acceptance even in moments of failure. And so the benefits of holding ourselves kindly extend to a wide range of clinical issues, including depression and anxiety disorders, grief, trauma, addiction, and so many more. Kind self-talk provides an antidote to the powerful negative self-talk that our inner critics love to throw at us. Right? Developing a warm and gentle stance towards yourself and using kind self-talk can provide comfort, safety, and soothing when we're hurting or struggling. Holding yourself kindly is also the antidote to perfectionism and imposter syndrome. It involves using mindfulness, right? Non-judgmental present moment awareness to shift from an external locus of self-worth, right? relying on validation and reassurance from others to an internal one, being your own coach B, validating yourself, using kind self-talk, all of which is in your control, right? And as humans, we do love things that are in our control. And so we can see there are so many benefits and that was just a sliver of them. There's so many more benefits uh, that I didn't name that a quick Google search can show you or that by, you know, in a practicing this, you'll be able to experience for yourself. 
So there are six main elements or building blocks of self-compassion. Many people, you know, do have little to no experience of holding themselves kindly, and some may find it overwhelming, too hard, or even threatening. This is especially true if your entrance into this world involves diving headfirst into a, you know, intensive self-compassion exercise, such as, you know, a traditional meditation. Fortunately, though, there is another path to arriving at self-compassion. You can build this muscle through, you know, these little baby steps. Eight, there are six basic building blocks of self-compassion that I'll be descri uh, describing in a moment. And you can start with any of them. Ideally, whichever you find easiest, you know, work on that for a while. And then once you've made, you know, progress with that particular element, you could then start experimenting with another. And by going gently step-by-step, step, you will be able to build your self-compassion skills over time. And as you develop more of these building blocks, you can begin stacking them on top of each other to build a, a tall and stable tower of self-compassion. So the first element or building block is acknowledging pain. Acknowledging uh, pain plays an essential first step in self-compassion. Rather than our default mode of turning away from our pain as fast as possible, right? So the usual suspects of suppression, avoidance, denial, escape, or distraction, right? This process of acknowledging our pain involves consciously and intentionally noticing and acknowledging your own struggle or pain. Notice with openness and curiosity the painful or unpleasant inner experiences that are present within you in that moment. And then using non-judgmental language, it is often useful to express what you've noticed. If the quickest and simplest exercise involves following involves the following two steps. Start by acknowledging with kindness in your words an expression that non-judgmentally acknowledges the presence of pain. So for example, this is really painful. This is really hard. This hurts right now. I'm noticing anxiety. I'm having a feeling of shame. You know, this is a moment of struggle. And then say something that facilitates kindness to yourself. Right? So go easy on yourself. Uh, be kind to yourself. May I try to treat myself kindly? Gently does it. Or you can use a single word such as gentle or kindness. The next uh, building block uh, is about diffusing or unhooking from self-judgment. So most of us are intimately familiar with just how quick our minds are to judge and criticize us, to highlight our flaws and failures, label us as not good enough or an imposter. Hey, any of this sounding familiar? Um, if it is, then your mind sounds just like my mind. And so therefore, and everybody and so many others' minds, um, and so therefore, an, uh, an essential aspect of holding yourself kindly is learning to diffuse from all of that harsh self-talk. Unfortunately, we cannot turn our mind off or magically train our mind to stop speaking to us that way. Right? If you've tried, you know that it, it's just not possible. Even positive thinking won't stop our minds from judging and criticizing. Fortunately, we can learn to diffuse or also referred to as unhooking, separating, or detaching from those hard self-judgments and those not good enough stories by noticing, naming, and unhooking from those cognitions. The idea is to learn how to see them as nothing more or less than a string of words and pictures, right? Our thoughts are, are words that, you know, have letters. And when those letters are, you know, next to each other, they make syllables. Or they have uh, syllables and sounds that then create that word. 
eight. And so with, you know, we want to see them as what they are, just thoughts and pictures, words, without getting into, you know, any debates about whether they're true or false, right? You can let the thoughts come, stay, and go in their own good time without getting caught up or pushed around by them. Now, for example, try noticing and naming your thoughts, right? Here is my mind beating me up again. And even so, I'm going to try to be kind to myself. Or I'm having the thought that I can't do this. You know? Or, aha, there's the I'm not good enough story. You can also sing your thoughts, say them in a, a silly voice, um, or say them you know, repeatedly over and over again, either very quickly or very slowly. The idea here certainly isn't to belittle our, our thoughts or our minds in any way, but to create some distance, some space uh, for us to look at them. And then also for us to be able to take them a little bit more, hold them a little bit more lightly and not take them so seriously. Because again, they're just thoughts, not absolute truths or facts. The next building block uh, of self-compassion is acting with kindness. So all types of self-compassion practices revolve around the powerful core value of kindness. We can think of it as the glue that holds together all the other elements of self-compassion, right? Acknowledging uh, pain is an act of kindness. So the aim is to treat yourself with kindness once you acknowledge your pain uh, or struggle, and there are many, many ways in which you can act kindly towards yourself. One option that you know uh, I've mentioned already involves using kind self-talk, you know, such as reminding yourself that you are human uh, and that everyone makes mistakes and no one is perfect, uh, or talking to yourself in a gentle and understanding way much like you would speak to someone you care about in a similar situation. You can also offer yourself a kind gesture. For example, using kind self-touch, right? placing uh, a hand or both hands gently on your heart or on top of a painful or unpleasant feeling, taking some, a deep breath in, a slow exhale out. And you know, feeling that warmth of your touch and sending warmth and caring inwards all throughout, you know, to your body through your palm. Okay. For some people, you know, uh, giving themselves, you know, a little self hug or placing their hand somewhere else on their body can feel more comforting and soothing. And so I invite you to experiment with what gesture may, you know, feel the, the most helpful to you. Another thing you can do is kind, kind deeds for yourself, such as self-soothing rituals, hobbies and self-care activities that nurture and fulfill you, or spending quality time with people who treat you well. Or you can use kind imagery to tap into self-kindness, such as a, a loving kindness meditation, or imagine warm healing light going to the tops, uh, the parts of your body holding the pain or discomfort in order to soothe and heal. The next building block is acceptance. And in this context, acceptance does not mean passively uh, accepting a difficult situation. It, instead, it refers to accepting your thoughts, feelings, emotions, memories, urges, and sensations. It means opening up and making room for your thoughts and feelings, allowing them to flow through you without fighting them, running from them, or being controlled by them. This is very different from what humans often do when pain shows up in our lives. Okay? We try to escape it through activities that tend to make our lives worse in the long term. You know, which you know are typically not kind ways to treat ourselves. Right, doing something that we know is probably going to make it worse. When we practice accepting painful or difficult thoughts, feelings, memories, and sensations, instead of engaging in self-defeating or life 
straining things uh, to avoid them. This is an act of kindness in itself. Right? So for example, you can breathe into and around the pain, really making space for it and then exhaling it with a deep sigh. You can physicalize it, or you can expand your awareness to notice what else is present in addition to the struggle or pain. Uh, the fifth element is validation. And so as humans, we often tend to invalidate our own emotional experience when we are going through something difficult. We fail to acknowledge our pain as a valid experience that is normal and a natural part of being human. Our minds may tell us that we shouldn't feel this way, we shouldn't react like this, we should be able to handle it better, we shouldn't have these thoughts uh, and feelings, so just shoulding or should notting all over ourselves. Right? Our minds will likely belittle us tell us that we're overreacting, weak, or have nothing to complain about because others have it worse. And it may even tell us to toughen up or suck it up. Spoiler alert, uh, this type of harsh, critical, invalidating attitude is the very opposite of kindness. And as I mentioned, will only make things worse. And even though you cannot stop these invalidating thoughts from arising, you can validate your experience by learning to diffuse, right? To unhook or detach from these harsh, harsh self-judgments, from the unrealistic expectations and the unkind comparisons to others that your mind dishes out. So for example, you can say, you know, I'm having the thought that I shouldn't feel this way or aha, there it is again, the I'm an imposter story. Thanks, mind. Right? The other aspect is to actively validate your experience through self-talk. And so using a warm, caring inner voice, you can remind yourself that it is normal and natural for humans to have painful thoughts and feelings when life is difficult, when we make mistakes, when we get rejected, when we experience a failure, or when we experience any kind of reality gap. And a reality gap is a gap between the reality you want and the reality you've got. And so when your mind compares your emotional reactions unfavorably to those of others, remind yourself that you are unique. If anybody else had all the ingredients that make you, know, you the human that you are, they would respond the same way as you because they would in fact be you, right? Um, and so it is so important that we validate our own experiences, right? That is in our control versus needing to get validation or reassurance from others. The uh, last but not least, uh, connectedness is our sixth building blocker element uh, of self-compassion. And so when we're going through difficult situations or we're in pain, and it is common and natural for our minds to generate aloneness type thoughts, such as I'm the only one going through this or who feels this way. No one, no one cares. Everyone else is confident and can handle this or everyone else is better off than me. Uh, no one else knows what this is like and so on. And so to clarify, the problem is not, you know, having such thoughts. The problem lies in fusing with them, right? getting all caught up in and mm -hmm. buying into them. Um, you know, and when we get all caught up in them and buy into them, it creates uh, a sense of disconnection. Right? We may feel cut off, disconnected from others, you know, like we are on our own, the odd one out, no longer part of the group. And this makes our pain all the more difficult because we are struggling and suffering alone. Alternatively, developing a sense of connectedness with others can help with our pain and our struggle. For example, actively diffusing or unhooking from these types of thoughts can help develop such connectedness or spending time with people who care about you and treat you kindly and actively engaging with and being fully present with them. 
And just a little uh, pro tip that it's often useful to let these people know that you're struggling or in pain. And then when they offer it, to willingly accept and receive their kindness. Another way is to actively think about how your struggle and pain is something you have in common with all human beings on the planet. So your pain is not a sign of weakness or defectiveness. It's a sign that you are a living, caring human, and it tells you that you have a heart, that you care deeply, that some things really matter to you, and that you are facing a reality gap and pain is what every living, caring human feels whenever they meet a reality gap. And the bigger the gap, the more the pain. And so these are all just suggestions. There is a vast range of brief ways and flexible approaches to develop self-compassion. The invitation is to experiment and find the ones that fit best for you. So in closing, uh, self-compassion is the key to having a content and fulfilling life. It does not eradicate pain or negative experiences. It just embraces them with kindness and give them space, gives them space to transform on their own. Like any skill or muscle, holding yourself kindly requires consistent practice to develop it, step by step, one building block at a time. It is so absolutely worth it though. And you deserve to show up for yourself in a kind, caring, supportive way, regardless of what your mind has to say about that. And so just remember, it will never be perfect because perfection doesn't exist. Try to be flexible and patient with yourself, which is an act of kindness in itself. So I wanna uh, end with a quote. The most beautiful people we have known are those who have known defeat, known suffering, known struggle, known loss, and have found their way out of the depths. These persons have an appreciation, a sensitivity, and an understanding of life that fills them with compassion, gentleness, and a deep loving concern. Beautiful people do not just happen. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here today and to learn about, you know, uh, ways to hold yourself more kindly. And so I wish you many mindful, gentle, supportive moments with yourself today and every day moving forward. Thanks so much and take care. Bye.